but I selfishly found relief in being able to use what I've lived through to advocate for others. Absolutely. I would not blame the average person for looking at this and how it's been covered and not think that it is Hollywood brats at their, at their worst. How have we culturally allowed that to be the case? There's nothing wrong with talking about a woman's success or her ambition. It was at that moment that I realized the magnitude of my actions. What does it look like when people blame others for their mistakes? And what happens when someone tries to control people's perception of them? This video is a study in self-serving language and questionable statements. I've made one video about similarities between Amber and Megan. This one, however, covers new ground and looks at the similarities from different angles. Get ready, because things are about to get... Spicy. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This channel is all about the importance of words. Words that speak volumes about people's psychology. Welcome aboard. I'll focus on two areas. Linguistic self-defense, meaning the shields Amber and Megan use to counter criticism. Linguistic self-defense results in blame shifting. Impression management, meaning how Amber and Megan try to control our perception of them. In psychology, impression management is often associated with people with prominent but still fragile egos. Have you ever met someone with the characteristics I'm about to highlight? Let us know in the comments. Whatever else is on your mind is okay too. First, a little about the self-branding of celebrities. In general, celebrities want people to like them. That's why they use all the right buzzwords and advocate for uncontroversial opinions in a way that's almost always oversimplified and devoid of nuance. They don't want to upset the loud voices on different social media platforms. Two main aspects are involved in the self-branding. One, source attractiveness, and two, source credibility. Source attractiveness has to do with acting in a way that advances likability and similarity, making people identify themselves with the celebrity. Source credibility has to do with people's perception of the celebrity. What do we know about them? What's their track record? Do their self-proclaimed morals correspond to their actual behavior? Amber and Megan both use sympathy tactics to advance their source attractiveness. However, they try to control their source credibility by guiding people's perception of them. This, ironically, has the potential to damage said credibility, since many people know when they're being controlled or deceived. Let's see some clips that demonstrate the impression management of Amber and Megan. Amber first. In this first clip, Amber tries to tap into the thoughts and feelings of everyday people as she tries to enhance her relatability and hence, likability. This is all in theory, I should add. I come from Austin, Texas, a small town outside of Austin that you probably haven't heard of. No one has. Um, it's called Maynard. Okay. And uh, I was raised by my mother and my father. And I grew up with a little sister. Although I have a big sister as well. And your little sister's name is? Uh, her name is Whit. Whit Hurd. I would help him. I was more of a, a crash test dummy. You know, when you train a horse, you it, it's a wild animal. It doesn't necessarily like to be um, ridden. And uh, I was the son he never had. So it was my job to, you know, stay on. <laughs> We observe occasional insecure laughter, which could be rehearsed as well, and constant attentiveness to the jury. This fishing for sympathy and validation tactic has trying too hard written all over it. Uh, I, I worked uh, any job that I could from the time I was really young. I wanted to get out of Texas and do something with my life and see things and do things. I, I just always pushed myself to um, be able to accelerate the process. I grew up quite um, working class. You know, as long as I maintained an A average, I, uh, I, I enjoyed the benefit of a scholarship and effectively left school uh, at 16 years old, I believe. I took any job that I could. I worked at my father's construction company, but I answered phones and I uh, worked at a, like a modeling agency that was also 
you know, um, offered photography classes, makeup classes, hair, uh, and I eventually worked there long enough to be able to pay for my headshots. This passage portrays Amber as a hard worker and thus feeds into the emotional concept of the American dream. Amber disguises this self-praise, which it actually is, with humble and well-meaning body language. Next, it's time for the inevitable good person tactic. Here, Amber articulates all her wonderful qualities, as if anybody ever had any doubt. And what, if any, charitable work did you do when you were still young? It started off as a, a requirement for the school I went to. I really loved meeting people, so I worked at the soup kitchen every morning before school, um, during the school year. I worked at the um, with deaf kids for a while, and uh, yeah, I, I love it. I taught myself how to sign basic sign language, and then I um, I pursued it. I audited a uh, a translate um, a course at the community college, which I ended up going to. I remarkably was able to audit. Overall, Amber tries to persuade with emotional values to make the jury members relate to having dreams and working hard. This is the most crucial part of her source attractiveness. However, there are at least three problems with her narrative. One, the fact that her father had a business and horses doesn't connote working class, and a job I, answering uh, phones at a model agency, agency doesn't immediately connote hard work. Two, it doesn't sound like she took any job she could get, rather it sounds like she was selective and lucky. And three, the most important part. What she says has nothing to do with the case. It serves no other purpose than getting the jury to like her, which proved to be easier said than done. These three objections affect or can affect Amber's source credibility, whether or not we see congruence between her words and her actions. Amber's attempts to persuade got more and more desperate during the trial, hurting her credibility because all these persuasion attempts showed was that she was worried about the jury's perception of her. In other words, she was more concerned with being believed than actually being believable without having to say it. Get ready, because things are about to get cringy. And trauma until I realized I could do something with it. So to answer your question, Ben, it's... I. I was able to turn the things that I've lived through, my pain, my life experiences, into work, into action, into providing a voice for other people. I'm not a saint. I'm not trying to present myself as one, as you all know, but I selfishly found relief in being able to use what I've lived through to advocate for others, to bring light to these issues, to give a voice to people who don't have the voice and the platform that I have. And while I would not wish this situation on my worst enemy, if it gives a voice to someone who doesn't have it. First of all, we notice the buzzword, voice, Providing one of Megan's voice, favorites as well. Buzzwords sound good to many or maybe even most people, unfortunately, but are unspecific and vague most times, which is the point. Secondly, she humble brags when she says she selfishly, selfishly found, found relief in helping relief. people. Humblebrag consists of a seemingly self-critical statement that's actually used for the opposite effect, to highlight one's positive personality traits, not that the person necessarily has those traits, objectively speaking. If anyone tells you that their greatest flaw is that they're too much of a perfectionist, then they've actually told you that they're a perfectionist, which generally is a positive attribute. This is impression management. Amber wants people to see her as a spokesperson, as if she's not simply speaking for herself, but for other people. She doesn't let the audience make their own inferences. The two major problems with this kind of persuasion is that people feel like they're being talked down to, and it negates a story about her upbringing, trying to sound humble and relatable. Have you ever had someone tell you something about them that you initially believed, but then they said something that either contradicted or negated that thing? It's the same thing here. And the end result is more often than not that people find the speaker unreliable. This way, a strategy that's encoded with the intention to make the speaker sound and seem sincere can actually end up with the opposite decoding. 
That's why being sincere and authentic, or whatever other term, insincere and inauthentic people use, is something you just are without being aware of it. Most people saw through Amber's tactics, but unfortunately, it's not always like that. Prominent voices in society persuade people on an emotional basis every day. Emotions are fine sometimes, but logic is always fine. That's the difference between them. And if there's one thing social media have taught us, it's that common sense isn't so common in the world today. Let's see how Megan deals with impression management in a speech that many of you have had to endure before. Let me apologize for making you have to relive the trauma. But together we can do it. I know we can. It's hard for me also. But I believe that something positive can come from something less positive. Because that's how I am. Positive. An all-round good person, you might say. I'm very humble and... I'm very... What? What clip? Oh, the clip. Well, here it is. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am tremendously honored to be UN Women's Advocate for political participation and leadership. We should note how much time she takes to tell a simple story and how she tries to make it sound world-changing. The unnecessary details, many pauses, and remarkably slow speech rate all indicate how much she's enjoying the attention. What she says could have been said in 15 to 20 seconds, but because the speech strives for pathos, appeal to emotion and pity, it has been worded to elicit emotional reactions from the crowd. When I was just 11 years old, I unknowingly and somehow accidentally became a female advocate. It was around the same time as the Beijing conference, so a little over 20 years ago, where in my hometown of Los Angeles, a pivotal moment reshaped my notion of what is possible. A speech can be divided into a prologue, a critical event, and an aftermath. The prologue sets the scene and is typically relatively short. The critical event is the details of the story and is or should be the longest part, as it's the most important part. Not all critical events are important though, as not all speeches are important, contrary to what the speaker might mean. But you didn't hear that from me. The aftermath is the result or consequence of the critical event and is typically short. What we just heard is the prologue of Megan's story. She's already framing the audience's perception of the critical event that's about to follow, as she calls it a pivotal moment. The framing is about to get more prominent as she continues with the overly long critical event, as compared to most other stories about very trivial experiences. See, I had been in school watching a TV show in elementary school, and um, this commercial came on with the tagline for this dishwashing liquid, and the tagline said, Women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. <laughs> I remember feeling shocked and angry and also just feeling so hurt. It just wasn't right and something needed to be done. So I went home and I told my dad what had happened. And he encouraged me to write letters. So I did. To the most powerful people I could think of. Now, my 11-year-old self worked out that if I really wanted someone to hear me, well, then I should write a letter to the First Lady. Because even at 11, I wanted to cover all my bases. <laughs> she because says, even at even 11. At 11 even lets us know that she's supposedly still the type of person to cover all her bases. This is part of her self-branding. Also, it's worth noting that America she herself is smiling at the commercial's tagline while the audience is laughing. This is contrapuntal to the feelings of anger and sadness that she alleges to have felt. Typically, people don't laugh when remembering feelings of anger and sadness. 
Next, it's time for the exciting climax of the critical event. Personally, I can't wait to hear what happened. Finally, I wrote to the soap manufacturer. And a few weeks went by, and to my surprise, I received letters of encouragement from Hillary Clinton, and it was roughly a month later when the soap manufacturer, Procter & Gamble, changed the commercial for their ivory clear dishwashing liquid. <laughs> they changed it from women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans to people all over America. Three minutes and 30 seconds later, we finally arrive at the conclusion, which is as simple and unsurprising as the critical event itself, when describing the letters she received with vowel lengthening and pauses, we get a glimpse of the status that's so vital to Megan and that I've analyzed in previous videos. It's crucial for her to be associated with and be seen with the right people, which, judging by the crowd, seems to be this conference's primary, if not only, purpose. Finally, it's time for the aftermath, which builds a bridge from the story elements to how she felt afterwards. Get ready for some extreme impression management with music. It was at that moment that I realized the magnitude of my actions. At the age of 11, I had created my small level of impact. Here we have Megan concluding on the details of the critical event, talking about the magnitude of her actions and the impact she allegedly made. In terms of body language and tonality, she herself makes it sound almost unfathomable that she was able to pull this off. This is an invitation to the audience to feel the same. And luckily, they'll clap for anything. Another way Megan engages in impression management is by defending herself under the guise of fighting for a bigger cause. This is a tactic commonly applied in politics, creating a problem and creating division where there is none for self-interest, and have people fight your battles online in different comment sections and offline with protests. How have we culturally allowed that to be the case? There's nothing wrong with talking about a woman's success or her ambition or her financial prowess. Why is it culturally we are equipping girls and women to think that if you are ambitious, there's something negative about that? Whereas if a boy is described that way, or if a man certainly is described as ambitious, that's an incredibly positive thing culturally. But I, I don't know how we end up changing that. No one said anything about it being wrong to talk about success and ambition, and certainly no one said anything about it being a cultural issue. Yet Megan presupposes that this is the case. Presuppositions are powerful in that they imply shared agreement, what's understood as good and bad, right and wrong, so that the speaker doesn't have to provide actual grounds for their claim. Instead it ends up just being a claim. Success Megan uses the word ambition, ambition which is a sensitive word to her. We learned that in her podcast with Serena Williams. Here, she again tried to counter the resistance she's faced under the guise of fighting for a bigger cause. She says that ambition is a dirty word when it comes to women, which is a generalization that she has yet to prove with non-anecdotal evidence. Presuppose that we can trust her anecdotes to begin with. She then says that she doesn't personally remember feeling the negative connotation behind the word ambitious until she started dating her now husband. This is an implicit reference to her interview with Oprah. Here it was more than implied that Harry decided to leave the UK with Meghan because she told him that she feared for her mental health. Not once has Meghan been criticized for her ambition, but this is what she's trying to make it seem like. And she says this while still making it sound like she speaks generally. So when Megan says this to the interviewer. You used the word ambition just now. Oh, and it's a trigger word. What? No. It sounds more like self-projection. That ambition is a trigger word for her. And thus she assumes that it is for everyone else. As we've just seen, impression management is linked to linguistic self-defense, which is the area I'll turn to now. Let's focus on Amber's first TV interview after the verdict and observe her self-protective statements. 
for some people, they just were frankly disgusted by the whole thing and don't have much sympathy for either one of you. Can you understand that? Absolutely. I would not blame the average person for looking at this and how it's been covered and not think that it is Hollywood brats at their at their worst. I d this can look can like Amber that. agreeing with the interviewer, but Absolutely. it's not. She was asked if she understands why some people were disgusted by the whole thing and didn't have sympathy for either of them. This question so sensitive to her that she modifies it by saying that she wouldn't blame the average person for thinking this and how it's been covered. As she adds, linguistically, this minimizes Amber's attempt to sound in agreement. Absolutely. Next, Amber performs association, associating with other people, as if this is about them also. But what people don't understand is it's, it's actually so much bigger than that. This is, uh, this is not only about our First Amendment right to speak. The conjunction, but, but also minimizes Amber's preceding assurance, absolutely, as it emphasizes the following sentence and minimizes the previous. And the associating possessive pronoun our, our First Amendment is her rights. attempt to make it seem like everyone else is in the same boat. We get the concept of free speech from the Greeks. My understanding of what that means is not just the freedom to speak. It's a freedom to speak truth to power. She appeals to a supposed victim role, that she's speaking up to power, as she calls it. And from her written reaction to the verdict, we know who she includes in this power, Johnny Depp. This is another aspect of her linguistic self-defense. Next, it finally sounds like she's going to hold herself accountable. However, she keeps inserting words that tell us what's really on her mind. People tell the truth about who they are, especially when they don't want to. You say you were responding, but there is evidence. There are tapes. When I asked his lawyers, why do you think you won? And the answer I got was because she never took responsibility for anything she did in the marriage. I did do and say horrible, regrettable things throughout my relationship. Uh, I behaved in horrible, almost unrecognizable to myself ways. There's so much, I have so much regret. I freely and openly and voluntarily talked about what I did. I, I talked about the horrible language. I talked about being pushed to the extent where I didn't even know the difference between, you know, um, right and wrong. Saving face is crucial to her. The first time we noticed this is when she says that she behaved Almost in unrecognizable, unrecognizable to, herself, to ways. herself ways, indicating that her default mode is supposedly very different. The second time is when she says that she's freely, openly and voluntarily talked about what she did. This is virtue signaling, which is linked to the first category, impression management, guiding people's perception of her. The third time is when she uses passive voice. I talked about being pushed. Linguistically, passive voice relieves her of accountability, the reverse of what she should be doing at this point in the interview. Megan's way of protecting herself linguistically is best illustrated by her statements from her interview with Oprah. An interview that was so inspiring that it's now nowhere to be found. Luckily, we have transcripts from the organic conversation between the two. First of all, when talking about the feud between Catherine and Megan, Megan makes sure to emphasize that Catherine allegedly made her cry and really hurt her feelings. Details she didn't have to give about Catherine, who, unlike Megan, has a positive image. But wait, she has ambitions. So how can she be popular? This wouldn't have to do with the fact that a person's ambition is never the problem but that there are ways of communicating one's ambition that are more desirable than others, would it? No way. Many people willingly ignore this distinction for the sake of complexity reduction, so that while letting the world know how tolerant and loving they are, they can brand people as either friends or haters. Megan can't help but praise herself, because when describing how she generously forgave Catherine, she says that Catherine did what she would do in a supposed similar situation. Megan's linguistic self-defense consists of blaming everyone else, 
First, she associates with all Americans by saying that it's easy to have an image that's far from reality, because what you know about the royals is what you read in fairy tales. Notice how she doesn't phrase this as her opinions, but as facts, for everyone that is. By inference, however, she tells us that she had an image that was far from reality. Also, the fact that she actually uses fairy tales as grounds for her claim to not having an understanding of what the day-to-day -day was going to be like suggests unrealistic expectations. She also compared herself to the little mermaid who got her voice back. Frankly, I'm at a loss for words for once. So beautiful. When Oprah finally confronts Meghan with people's suspicions of her, that she only married Harry to build her brand, Meghan starts lashing out at anything and anybody, that there was no guidance, that she had to Google the national anthem, that nothing was offered to her. The criticism of the royal family that she's tried to hold back is now out in the open. That's how sensitive Oprah's confrontation is to her. Elevating challenges to problems is the best way Meghan could have let people know how cornered she feels. Unintentionally, of course. I hope you found the video useful. Before you leave, like the video and subscribe to the channel.